Welcome to Perpetually Patek, a forum for all things Patek Philippe. Today we're discussing modern Patek Philippe chronographs, and we're starting with the foundational watch of the entire era, and that's the 1998-5070. Brian, what did it represent when it came out? So the 5070, when it came out, represented the first Patek Philippe chronograph to be launched in roughly 40 years. It was 42 millimeters, very large for the time, and it was inspired by a possibly unique aviator-inspired split-second chronograph. And it was truly groundbreaking for the brand when it came out. And it's important to remember that even then, uh, the Stearns were drawing from their heritage. The 2512 in both conventional time telling and split seconds form was an enormous watch. Out of the museum, I think 46 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And so the 5070 was actually a scaled down version of that. Part of the genius of the design was A, that it drew from history, but also that the multiple concentric tracks on the dial and the double stepped pagoda bezel helped to disguise the disparity between case size and movement size. And you know, interesting enough, we're going to be focusing on uh, more modern era pieces. But I think that that watch in particular was actually something that you could see being launched more today than when it was launched in 1998. Oh, it was colossal. I mean, if you think about it, back in the late 90s, what was the other major chronograph that debuted? It was on everyone's lips in 1999. That was the Dotograph. It was big at 39 mm -hmm. millimeters for a dress watch. It was big. But the 5070 was huge. Now, over the years, there was a constraint on the production volume. It was generally about 250 pieces per metal per year of the 5070. We had white gold, we had yellow gold, we had rose gold, and then finally the series concluded with platinum. But Patek made a surprising decision at the end of this well-regarded line mm -hmm. to downsize the case. Why did it do it and what form did that take? So it came out in the form of the 5170, which was actually their first in-house chronograph movement. It came in at around 39.4 millimeters, so definitely smaller in size, much more traditional in aesthetic, uh, more refined case, traditional appearance, uh, pulsation uh, track going around the dial, a much more 1940s aesthetic, I would say, uh, for the traditional collector. And it's important to remember looking back to look forward, that in 2005, Patek did experiment with an in-house chronograph caliber, and that was in the 5959, a quirky little watch. It was a niche piece, but it was an important building block. 33 millimeters, the world's smallest purpose-built split-second chronograph at the time, and that was the 27525, an interesting movement that built sort of a bridge to the 29535 in the 5170. When the 5170 was launched, you really had a lot more differentiation between the product lines. And I think that that's going to be one of the major themes of this show is what is Patek Philippe doing today that's even that much different than what it was doing in, let's say, the 2010s. And so there was a strong contrast between the sports pieces, the Nautiluses, the Aquanauts, and then the other complications, you know, the annual calendars, the chronographs that we're talking about right now. And the 5170 lasted uh, all the way up until I believe it was 2018 or 19. I think it's 2019 when it ended with the 5170 So uh, in platinum. So the 5170 in platinum was produced from 2017. It ended in 2019. And then the entire line was discontinued in favor of the 5172. And this really takes me to where I think Patek Philippe is today. So the 5172 with its stepped case, 41 millimeter size, pump pushers, is very much a nouveau vintage watch in terms of the inspirations and the aesthetics. And was designed for what I would call the modern collector. And it really has bridged the gap between the sport watch category and the strap watch category in that I would call it a casual dress watch. And I think it's important to understand the difference between the rollout of the 5170 and the rollout of the 5172. Because when we first saw the 5170 in 2010, it was yellow gold. It had Roman numerals and stick indices on a silver dial. It was extremely classical. Now, in 2013, we got white gold, silver dial, brigade numerals. And in 2015, we got the white gold, brigade numerals, black dial, Next year, same watch, but with rose gold. And we finally got a platinum model mm -hmm. for the last two years of the run. But it started so classical and so conservative, only to become a little bit sportier and more modern later on, whereas the 5172 immediately launched with the crowd-pleasing blue dial, mm -hmm. with the white metal case. Calfskin strap. Fully loomed. Mm -hmm. It's a much sportier watch. Is there any reason, do you see a change in Patek's 
uh, maybe target buyer, maybe driven a little bit by interest in the sports watches generally? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely been a trend in producing more casual type dress watches. And this in largely is influenced by the fact that the demographic is trending younger, right? You've got more collectors in their 20s and their 30s and even 40s than ever before, right? You know, it's not the 55 plus collector anymore. And so when you had such stark contrasts between the different collections, people tend to flow to just one way, right? Like if you were buying their sport pieces, you may not have been interested in purchasing a 5170 Dre, right? It might've been just too traditional or too classic for you. But now they're producing watches that really complement other parts of the collection and can definitely be worn with more utility. Without a doubt, blue dial, white metal case, mm -hmm. fully loomed, much sportier than in the past and larger at 41 millimeters compared to 39.4 for the 5170. So it's bigger, but it's not big. No, it's still a thin watch. And I think that for the first time, and it actually started this year, Patek Philippe is presenting watches almost thematically, right? There's this thematic element across collections. It's not just a single launch or a single piece, right? You, you see elements uh, moving across the, the different lines. And so this nouveau vintage category, I would say, right, where that started with really the 5524, the uh, pilot's watch travel time, that then transitioned to the 5320, which was the step case, perpetual calendar, cream dial, syringe hands, like very much a vintage aesthetic. And you even see this continued with the 5172 that was just launched this year with a salmon dial. So now you're gonna have both variations of the watch, both the blue dial and the blue calf, also with the salmon dial. And I think that this is a trend that's going to stay uh, very much because it's a really a younger buyer. Yeah, and if you look at how long it took us from 2011 to 2018 to get a salmon dial 5270 and how long it took from 2010 to 2017 to get a blue dial 5170, it's interesting to see Patek launching the crowd-pleasing combinations of case metal and dial right out of the gate. And I suspect that long before the announcement of the discontinuation of the 5711 was actually announced, there was an understanding within Patek Philippe that this was gonna happen. And the solution was to release sportier versions of standard dress watches mm -hmm. to eventually make up the difference once the sports watch was phased out. No, for sure. And, you know, Mr. Stern has said time and time again that they're not going to be a sports watch company. And the releases this year, I really think, are a testament to that, right? They're discontinuing a lot of the watches that were launched in the early 2010s and coming out with crowd pleasing favorites that I think are creating a lot more demand for strap models. And the chronograph is always going to be a pillar to the watches that they're coming out with. And I'm actually very excited about the releases and particularly the 5470 that just came out. And so we have a 10th of a second chronograph, the first time the Patek Philippe has produced a watch like this. You've got it in the same case as the 5370, so a larger, more modern case. You have a textile strap. So right out of the gate, you see that Patek is targeting that sporty, casual look, but also retaining the traditional vibes and not just throwing it in an Aquanaut or Nautilus case. Uh, without a doubt. I do think actually though it's important to talk about some of the sports chronographs because you mentioned it had been decades since mm -hmm. Patek had launched a water-resistant chronograph before it launched the 5070, but truth be told there had never been true sports chronographs mm -hmm. in the modern sense prior to the arrival of the Nautilus chronograph mm -hmm. in 2006. Talk a little bit about what that model meant to the line at the time. So. At the time, it represented a slightly thicker, slightly larger version of this traditional Nautilus. And I think a lot of collectors nowadays don't realize that when this watch was launched, it did come out to big fanfare and was very popular, but that quickly subsided. Um, these watches sat in showcases. And at the time, if you were purchasing a 5980, which is the stainless steel chronograph, you were purchasing that watch uh, more because you wanted a complicated Patek Philippe and something that substantiated you perhaps more as a collector of complications than purchasing the more readily available uh, and simpler 5711. Also, Patek had launched a world premiere in 2006, which was the 5960 annual calendar Correct. flyback chronograph, and the Nautilus chronograph used a version of that movement. Mm -hmm. So 
it was a way to leverage something that they were going to launch anyway while also creating a first ever for the Nautilus collection and a watch that is a little bit simpler in appearance and function than the 5960 and still 120 meters water resistant. Mm -hmm. The 5960 when it came out was actually vastly more popular than the 5980 was. And it was the first time that Patek Philippe had introduced a complication with the annual calendar complication. And so when the Nautilus launched, uh, it did not have a moving second hand, which some people uh, thought was very interesting, but it did have a flyback functionality, which allowed you to run the second hand perpetually throughout the duration of wear. And it's also important to remember that the Chronograph series uh, in 2013 gaining a rose gold Nautilus Chrono mm -hmm. and a two-tone Nautilus Chrono. And then the next year, the retirement of the Steel 5980, we get the 5990 Travel Time, which could be called the most versatile watch Patek Philippe makes. For sure. So you've got travel time, you've got water resistance, mm -hmm. you've got automatic winding, you've got steel, you've got loom, and you've got the flyback chronograph all in one. And also a precursor to the arrival of the Aquanaut chronograph in 2019. Talk about how that expanded the line, because it's a bigger, bolder watch than you get with the standard 5980. No, for sure. And you, you've seen, since Patek Philippe launched these movements, you've seen a increase in the combination of different complications. And so we've also seen an increase in the size of certain pieces. You know, we saw the Patek Philippe Nautilus that was traditionally 40 millimeters transition up to 42, and we saw the same thing with the Patek Philippe Aquanaut. So we saw that the Aquanaut transitioned from 40 to 42 uh, in the 5168G case, uh, and then we saw that continue with the introduction of the chronograph movement also in the 42 millimeter case. And what this did was it expanded the, let's call it the Aquanaut category. Um, it added various movements. It increased the size, so you had more versatility. But they were launched in both the blue and the khaki green. And I think that this added a younger, more contemporary look and also more versatility against the traditionally black Aquanaut. Colorations. And there is a tremendous push towards, I would say, more youthful timepieces because with the Aquanaut chronograph, right out of the gate, orange straps, orange mm -hmm. dial details. Last year, we got examples in green and in blue. Is this a consequence of Patek realizing it needs younger customers or responding to the fact that many of its customers are now younger? So it's like a chicken and egg question. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's the latter. I think that it's them responding to a younger client who perhaps have an interest in, let's say, a broader cat category of the same type of product, right? Where collectors are purchasing multiple Aquanauts and not just one. You also see that the launch was not in steel, but in precious metal and white gold. And I think that this is important because it shows Paddock's hesitancy to rely on steel, right? They're saying, we're, we're gonna continue producing sport watches, we're gonna continue building out the category, but we're also gonna do it in precious metal. We're gonna have less steel and more precious metal as we go forward. And I think you're gonna actually see that very much so in the Nautilus as well. And I think this is a great transition point to talk about some unconventional chronographs mm -hmm. in recent Patek history. The trial run for a bigger, one might even say oversized, Patek Philippe sports chronograph was the 40th anniversary Nautilus chronograph mm -hmm. back in 2016. 44 millimeters diamond indices, white gold, very controversial. Do you think that was sort of a test balloon for the larger, bolder Aquanaut chronographs that came later? You know, I don't know if it was a test case for the larger pieces that we see today. I think that it was trying something new and obviously something very different. I don't see them producing a, and you know what, I I may go back and watch this video and be like, I was wrong, but I don't see them producing a Nautilus of that size anytime soon. I think that the watch was quite large. I think that it was novel for what it was, but I do think that they found a sweet spot in that 42 millimeter size. And continuing our march backwards, the year prior to that, you mentioned it in passing, uh, but the 5370 really deserves recognition mm -hmm. as sort of a restatement of Patek Philippe's horological prowess. We talked about the niche 5959, which mm -hmm. was tiny, split second, very polarizing with an officer's watch case. But the 5370P in both black and blue dials mm -hmm. is almost universally lauded. What kind of a statement was that for Patek? Well, I think that A, for them at the time, it was an accessible price point, all things considered, for a split second chronograph. It was done in a very modern case in size at 41 millimeters. And you had those hollowed out lugs. So it was very much for the modern collector. You had the black enamel dial, which was typically reserved for the ultra high complications, right? Minute repeater, tourbillons, et cetera. And so it just made 
for what I think was probably the most beautifully executed chronograph at the time of its launch. It was for sure uh, the baby of Mr. Stern. And I think it's probably one of the best modern era chronographs that's ever been produced. It was followed up by the blue enamel variation, which to me is equally as nice, but definitely more casual in appearance. I, de I think black enamel finds itself to be a little bit more dressy and the blue a little bit more casual. And I think that it really offered a nice contrast between the two. Uh, but overall, you can see a trend there. You can see the direction that Patek Philippe was going in producing a watch like that to be more modern and be, let's say, not quite as traditional. And without a doubt, the fact that the watch was loomed was a pretty profound mm -hmm. statement of intent that this was going to be a dress watch, but a sporty dress watch. Mm -hmm, for sure. And you can also see the development in Patek as a company in that we had enamel dials in blue and black. If you go back to the 90s, if you got a 5016, a grand complication, mm -hmm. in a black dial, you were getting black lacquer, Correct. not enamel. So that was a big step forward in the fit, finish, and materials used, even on the top end watches. And you mentioned that the 5172 is a vintage inspired piece. You can really see those tiered lugs mm -hmm. off the historic reference 2405. And that speaks to the advancement in Patek case making, the same way the cabochon lug hollow case flank design of the 5370 was a major statement of Patek's advances in mm -hmm. case making because they do make their own cases. No, for sure. And I think that with the, you no, know, we touched on the 5470. But I think that you can, you know, the, the sporty elements of the watch, right? Having the one tenth there in red on the dial, um, having that textured material strap shows that they can take a watch and they can have something that seems more dressy or traditional with the 5370 with the all black and then have it be much more modern, even approaching sporty in terms of appearance with the 5470. And the Patek case making is something that recurs throughout modern chronographs from the brand, especially the 5975, which is a quirky watch mm -hmm. from the anniversary year of 2014. They made it in every metal, but every single version was a flyback chronograph, automatic winding, and a triple scale dial. It was the ultimate niche chrono, but I think it's pretty cool. Was it neither here nor there a one-off, or did it point towards a greater willingness to take risks? I do think it was a one-off. But I do think that it was a willingness to take risks, to show that they can take something from their museum and that they can come out with it uh, at a special time in their history and be one and done, right? Here's a collection of watches. It's interesting, it's unique. We're not looking for this to be across multiple years. And it was exactly that. It was a collector's item that was, that was produced for a big anniversary. And I think that it catered definitely more towards the traditional collector at the time. And I think it is super quirky because first mm -hmm. of all, you've got a triple scale, telemeter, tachymeter, pulsimeter. You've got a chronograph with one hand, seconds only, flyback capability, no date, and fairly bold in the modern era, a solid case back with commemorative dedication rather than a display case back. Mm -hmm. And you know what? At the time, I think that you would have said that the watch was a little bit busy in terms of the dial appearance, but you fast forward to today, and you have a Calatrava like the 5212, which is equally as busy, but is lauded as one of the most popular watches that's currently being produced by them. So it's, it's very interesting how, when you fast forward a couple of years, how taste and preferences can change.